I think in a world of the Christmas we live in, things have gotten so commercialized, and you hear that every year, uh, and it seems to only get worse, you know, it, um, and how, when it comes to Christmas, what does Christmas really mean, and, and uh, how does it impact our life, and we could say Christmas means a lot of things, and, and for kids to pause and say Christmas is something more than just gifts, that it's more than what you wish for, and you get everything you wish for, and we're, we're living in day. I don't know about you, but how many, when you grew up, you didn't get everything you put on your list as a kid to get, and, uh, and yet today, so many of our kids get everything they want, and even the things they just happened to mention they wanted, and then you find out they really didn't want it. It was just in that moment they wanted it, Right? And, and, and really, Christmas is about something more than that. We're in a series right now called Christmas Unexpected and, and dealing with something in Christmas. So if you have your Bible, I'm going to ask that you open your Bible for the, just the next few mo- moments. And I want to just share just a word with you uh, in part three in this series. Uh, you know, there are, two, there are four Gospels, and two of the four Gospels talk about Christmas. Uh, Matthew and Luke. And Luke is usually the, the book that we go to when we're reading the Christmas story. But Matthew also, also talks about the Christmas story. And Matthew starts out in an unusual way. Matthew starts out talking about the genealogy of Jesus, which makes you feel all Christmassy, doesn't it? Uh, there, there aren't a whole lot of Christmas songs on the genealogy of Jesus. Uh, you could probably twist the 12 days of Christmas and, or do, do something along that line, but uh, there, is, there isn't a whole lot on that. And yet, the point of the whole meaning of Christmas comes back to the, this genealogy. Uh, Matthew was a tax collector. He was considered worse than a sinner. Now, if you didn't know what worse than a sinner was, well, just visit an IRS agent. You'll know what they thought. Uh, I, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, but in that day, if you were a tax collector, you were considered worse than a sinner uh, because they were doing Rome's bidding by collecting taxes and often taking advantage of individuals in order to make money for themselves. And, and so this whole idea of Matthew writing this, he was wanting to identify something about Jesus because the religious leaders of that day felt their Messiah was going to be the one that was going to deliver Israel from Roman rule and, and that their Messiah was going to be pure Jew, pure Jewish. He was going to be the Jewish Savior. And the religious leaders of that day really identified the Messiah as being perfect, that he would be the essence of perfection in every way, and their idea of perfection exceeded that of God's idea of perfection. Can, can we stop just for a moment and have everybody look up here for one moment? What you think is perfect is sometimes beyond what God's perfection is. Sometimes your idea of perfection is unrealistic. You can turn to the person next to you and say, you're unrealistic. Some of you don't want to do that because you just had an argument about what way we're going to do this. <laughs> there's, a, there's this thing called unrealistic expectations. And a lot of times people have unrealistic expectations, don't you think? And so this Messiah, their expectation of what the Messiah was be, it was already formed, and they would debate it in their religious circles. They would have small groups on on how the Messiah is going to look and how perfect, and they're adding to him all of these things. And Matthew points to Jesus as being the Messiah, and he says, by the way, I want to show you where he came from. And this is the statement we're really working around through this series is Christ didn't just come for sinners. He came from sinners. He didn't just come to set people free. He came from a place of sinners, from people who were sinners, who were not redeemed. They were broken. And we looked at the, and the genealogy really identifies this, and it identifies the point of Christmas, the whole point of all of this, what, what Christmas is really all about, and why we should celebrate that, that today we live post-Messiah. Somebody should say amen to that. 
Because who knows what we would be like if I didn't have the help of the Holy Spirit. You know, thank God for the Holy Spirit that is changing me from the inside out. That is taking me at what, from what I was and turning me into who he is Amen. in time. And how many, how many have arrived there yet? Anyone? No, of course not. Because you'd be like one of those religious leaders. So, so we're, we're looking at this genealogy of Jesus. In Matthew 1, 1 through 5, it says the record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David. We should have Christmas music playing behind this. The son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac, the father of Jacob. Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers. And we talked about that last week. Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah whose name was Tamar, and we talked about her last week. Perez, the father of Hezron. Hezron, the father of Ram. Ram, the father of, a, you know, Ram. What a name. I'm going to name you Ram. Uh, here's some great names. If you're having a baby and you're looking for some names, you know, here are some great names for your next child. Aminadab, don't, that's probably too hard to say for, for a little baby. The father of Nishan, and, and when I read this before, Wilbur says, I knew it. There is a black man in the genealogy of Jesus. Amen. <laughs> Wilbur, he, he's like, I knew it. And Nishan, the father of Solomon, Solomon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Now, the religious leaders knew at that time that Rahab was not somebody you needed to bring up. And I, and I brought this up before. Matthew went out of his way. To bring up not the honored women of the day. He went out of his way to bring up the women you want to forget about. Now, my father-in-law is doing, uh, he, he did the, when he retired, uh, he had a lot of time on his hands. And so he went to this thing, and a lot of guys that, you know, work, he went to this thing called Ancestry.com, right? And he did all that he knew about his, and then he went and did mine and all the in-law kids, Right? And, and uh, he went through all of our, the ancestry. He asked me all. He called me. He says, I got questions for you. And he's asking me. And I'm like, really, Larry? I don't know. Uh, you got to call my dad. And he talked to my dad. You know, he, he was into this thing. And, uh, and what he found out is here for all of my life, I, I thought I was 100% a German. And I'm actually part Russian. Now, some of you are saying that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> <laughs> I, I always could do that dance when I was a little young. But, but the, the uh, you know, and he finds that stuff out. And, you know, when you look at your, you, when you go to ancestry and you look at the, your ancestry, you, you, don't, you hope to find someone like, someone great, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, I don't know, someone great in history that, that is a king or some war hero or someone, and then you find Attila the Hun or, or you find someone like, you don't, want, you don't really want to bring that up. I mean, if, if, you were, if you were Hitler's grandson, I'm sure you would not go around telling people that, Right? I mean, if you found, that, found out that somebody in your ancestry was not somebody really, uh, you know, was, was, was someone that, that, that people didn't look up to or look at, it, and they say, you're really from that person? Oh, okay. You know, so, so for Matthew to bring up these ladies, Tamar, I mean, really, Tamar? You have Mary, and you're going to bring, or you have uh, 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 Rebecca, and you got Sarah, and you're going to bring up Tamar, and then you bring up Rahab. And by the way, Rahab was Rahab the, you know, a scarlet letter before there was ever the scarlet letter. Can you imagine being known as that even after you rescued, you helped rescue Israel, the, the spies, and then were a part of them coming into Jericho? And I'll, I'll tell the story very quickly. And yet she was still known as, as Rahab the... And it is interesting because we do, we do label people. We put things on people and we know them as something. Maybe you're known as something. 
And, and Rahab was known as this prostitute. She was known as someone who had this past. And Matthew was saying, I was a tax collector, and Jesus came to me. Did you know Ma Jesus, that Matthew got caught tax collecting by Jesus? And while he's tax collecting, Jesus said to Matthew, Matthew did not even repent. Matthew didn't get up and say, oh, I'm so sorry, Jesus, that I'm collecting taxes. Did, Matthew didn't come to this point of revelation in his mind that Jesus was the Son of God, that Matthew was sitting there, and Jesus came to Matthew and said, Matthew, why don't you come and follow me? You know what Matthew did? He got up, and he followed Jesus. He didn't clean himself up first. He had a reputation. We know him as Matthew the tax collector. And that's the point of the story, because maybe you in this room have a past. Maybe you're here and you've done some things in your past that people know you by. Now, there's a book called The Scarlet Letter, and, and if, you grew, if you went to school, when I went to school, we had to read that book. And, and, and there was a woman given a scarlet letter because of adultery, and she was put that scarlet letter of A on her, and it was stuck to her, and she had to walk around her community, and everybody saw that scarlet letter, and nobody associated with her because of the scarlet letter. And there are many of you in this room that think you can't even associate with God because of the scarlet letter that's been permanently sewn onto you. And so you live your life with these expectations or you live your life with this letter on you and you find yourself almost bound by this past like God would never accept me because what I've done in the past or what I'm even involved with right now. Can I tell you right now, God will come to you and say, follow me. And maybe you don't stop tax collecting right away, but God will eventually bring you to a place where he changes you from the inside out. You know, in the Garden of Eden, there were two trees. Maybe you've heard this story before. And in the garden was the tree of life and the tree of knowledge. And we stop and we say, we often think the tree of knowledge of evil. Right? We hear the tree of knowledge of evil. But the reality, it wasn't just the tree of knowledge of evil. It was the tree of knowledge of evil and good. And what we've replaced God with... What we replaced the tree of life with, what we replaced Christ with as the source, the holiness in our life is knowledge. You see, the only one who can change you from the inside out, the only one who can give you true life is not more knowledge of good. It is not by changing your behavior or the knowledge of better behavior. Or if you just do this, then you're going to get the results you want. Because knowledge will never give you life. That's right. Only Jesus can give you life. Amen. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and life. And there are a lot of believers... There are a lot of believers that come into church, they come into a place like this, as narrow as it is, and they'll come in here and they'll say, tell me something that I can know better to deal with the knowledge of evil that I have. Because I got all this knowledge of evil. I know how to do evil. I do evil. I have all that knowledge of evil. But give me knowledge that will counteract evil Good knowledge, knowledge that will help me, teach me, help me. You, you tell me what I need to do to overcome this. And so we psychologize, sociologize, physiologize, theologize, everything with better knowledge that teaches us good, when in reality, knowledge will never set you free. We have more books on marriage than we have ever had in history, and the number of divorces are increasing to an alarming extent. Right? If we have so much knowledge in how to have a great marriage, why do we have terrible marriages? Isn't that right? If we have, we have more knowledge on how to have great finances than we have ever had before in history, 
and how to do things the right way. We got more knowledge of how to have better relationships than we've ever had before in history. We have more knowledge than any other culture has ever had before in history. But why are we more broken than ever before in history? Why do we got unrest like we've never seen before in history? Why are things so unsettled if knowledge was the answer? It's because knowledge has always been the problem. And I'm not saying we get dumb or stupid or we don't, we don't learn things. But what I'm saying is it's the tree of life that brings life. Amen. And the tree of life was the baby that came in flesh in a manger. I was going to grab the baby, but... <laughs> That's a... That's a struggling baby there. <laughs> I think it spends some time in our nursery. <laughs> it's good there are two arms, though. <laughs> you know, the, Jesus is the tree of life. And this is the point that Matthew is getting to. Matthew is saying, just, just as Jesus came from Rahab... The prostitute, someone who had a label, someone who wasn't perfect, someone who had a, it, a legacy for being known as the woman that, yeah, she is the woman that hid the spies, but she was, a, she was not the woman that the law would accept. In fact, the religious leaders of that time would have been upset with Matthew even bringing it up in, in terms of the Messiah because in their law, she should have been put to death. Matthew is saying, but isn't it interesting that Jesus can say that that was his great, 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 great grandmother? That when he sees her, he'll say, hi, grandma, how are you doing? And you don't talk about somebody's grandmother. I'm talking, right? You talk about a lot of things. You talk about my grandma. We're going to have some business. <laughs> right? The, the reality is it doesn't matter who you are or where you've been from. It doesn't matter if you've stopped doing something or, or you're going to stop doing something. Well, let me clean up first. The, the reality is Jesus is sitting here right now and he's saying, follow me. Matthew's saying that's what the Messiah was. The Messiah wasn't for a culture. The Messiah wasn't for a nation. The Messiah couldn't be possessed by just Jews. The Messiah was for every create, creation God created as a human being. He was for us. He was for someone 2,000 years from, from that point, 2,000. He was, in that, he was in that manger for you. And you can make him your Messiah today by simply getting up and following Jesus. You say, well, I don't know if I'm going to change or if I can change. The reality is, let me help you with that. I want to just encourage you. <laughs> you ain't going to change. Aren't you encouraged this morning? Because if you would have changed, you would have done it by now. Wow. If you could have changed yourself, you would have figured out some 28-day plan to change yourself. But you ain't going to change yourself. And if you can't do it on your own and your life is going in that spiraling, spiraling direction down, what will you do today? Will you say, God, I've been trying to change my life. It's a mess. I have a lot of broken things. But today I need you. I need life living in me. Because if I can't change me and I can't, maybe you can. Can I tell you there's only one person been changing people for 2,000 years and his name is Jesus Christ. And if you will go to him, he says, if you will draw unto me, I will come to you. He's just waiting for you. He's just waiting. His arms are just saying, I'm waiting. I'm right here. Just come and follow me. I'm not saying you change everything. You got to do. And when we got this thing where I got to change and I got to be perfect. You know, what, what I love is we have condemnation before we get saved. And as soon as we get saved, we say, let me just release a whole boatload of condemnation on you afterwards. Now that you're saved, we used to do this years ago. It's somewhat embarrassing. Uh, when I was saying this, we'd say, okay, now that you're saved, we got a 10-point list of all the things you need to stop doing right now. 
You know, boom, 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 boom. And, and we got three more for good measure. That's for the high achievers. For those who want to take the AP courses of salvation. Right? Can I tell you, you know what the problem with that is? Is when people fail, they feel like failures because you're going to fail. Because it's the Holy Spirit that comes in and says, it isn't changing behavior. This isn't a changing of behavior. It's a changing of nature. God takes you from a sinful nature to a Christ-like nature, and, and you start to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, and he begins to clean you up. And some of us clean up at a different pace than others. Am I right? I can tell you one thing. I get ready a lot faster than my wife. <laughs> now, some of you say, and the results show that. Merry Christmas to you, too. <laughs> right? That's the point. So Rahab, in this story, and I'm, I'm going to finish here. You can read this story in Joshua. Rahab was a woman that was known as the prostitute. And what the story in Joshua doesn't say is that a person came up to Rahab. A guy comes up to Rahab and says, hi, Rahab. How about you and I go out on a date? We'll go to drive-in or something. And they go out and they spend time that even though she had this reputation, somebody came up and loved her. And I, tell you, I can tell you right now that somebody loves you a whole lot. His name is Jesus. I've said this before. I said at a funeral, this, I think it was this last week. Was it this last week or the week before? We had a funeral here. Was it last week? It was this last week. Yeah, I can't remember. Time's going so fast. This is last. We had a funeral, and there was this room was full of people, and uh, and and I told them this because I read from John 14, and I and I said, listen, whether you accept it or not, God has already prepared a place for you. <laughs> Unfortunately, there are going to be some empty rooms in heaven. God's prepared a place for every single person in this room, whether they accept Him or not. You know, I believe Jesus is the greatest example of faith. He says, if I show you my love, how would you resist my love for you? Why would you say no? Jesus has removed all the barriers to come to him and to receive his love. There is nothing in the way. He's just waiting for you to say, yes, I'll come. You know, in that service about... Uh, 60% of the room raised their hand for salvation. And you're saying you're exaggerating because you're a preacher and you do that. You can ask anyone in here. I told them, I told them, just raise your hand up real fast and pull it down if you in, in want to invite Jesus Christ to come into your life. If you want to repent of the sins you're... Man, hands were going up all over the room. Well, you know why? <laughs> because that's the point of this story. How can you resist the love of a God that said, I came to rescue you. No, God, I want to stay in the burning building. No, God, I want to stay in my discouragement and depression. No, God, I don't believe in you. And God says, I'm, okay, I'm right here. Whether you believe in me or not, I'll stay right here. Whether you accept me or not, I'm going to be right here. I'm not leaving you because I've come to be your Messiah. I've come to set you free. I'm right here, God. I, I'm right here. And you're, you can say, well, God, I think you're a jerk. You can sing all kinds of songs. God's, he's, you know, and he's terrible and God's a hater and he, he's a divider. And you can say all those things and you know where God will be? Right next to you. Say, I'm right here. His love isn't going to flee from your hatred. In fact, if anything, his love is drawn your hatred because if he can go in and he can change you in a moment I, I'm looking at a couple right down here I'm not going to embarrass them but a year ago they came and God saved them didn't he isn't the power of salvation how do you resist how can you resist will you bow your head